Standing, would you turn to Exodus chapter 2 and uh, verse 15? It's been a while since we've been in Exodus. It's been a while since I've preached on Sunday night. I have missed it. Y'all may not have missed me preaching, but I have missed preaching. Uh, we have spent two or three sermons already in chapter 1 and chapter 2, and, and uh, next week, God willing, we're going to talk about the God of the burning bush. But tonight, we set the stage for that. I'm going to speak to you tonight about saved for God's glory. And I think that's a good theme for the book of Exodus. Saved for God's glory. The lessons of the wilderness. Read with me if you would, starting in verse 15. When Moses heard of this matter, well, what matter was that? That it had been made known to Pharaoh that he had killed the Egyptian and buried the man in the sand. When Pharaoh heard of this matter, he tried to kill Moses, but Moses fled from the presence of Pharaoh and settled in the land of Midian, and he sat down by a well. Now the priests of Midian had seven daughters, and they came to draw water and filled the troughs to water their father's flock. Then the shepherds came and drove them away. But Moses stood up, and he helped them, and he watered their flock. And when they came to rule their father, he said, Why have you come back so soon today? So they said, An Egyptian delivered us from the hand of the shepherds. And what is more, he even drew the water for us and watered the flock. He said to his daughters, Where is he then? Why is it that you have left the man behind? Invite him to have something to eat. That right there proves, by the way, they were Baptists. <laughs> Verse 21. Moses was willing to dwell with the man, and he gave his daughter Zipporah to Moses. And then she gave birth to a son, and he named him Gershom, for he said, I have been a sojourner in a foreign land. Now it came about in the course of those many days that the king of Egypt died, and the sons of Israel sighed because of the bondage, and they cried out, and their cry for help. They cried out, and their cry for help because of their bondage rose up to God. So God heard their groaning, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And God saw the sons of Israel, and God took notice of them. Would you pray with me? Father, we're so glad that you take notice of our sufferings. God, we're so glad that you see, that you know that you remember, and Father, not only that, that you act. Jesus said that not a spiral falls to the ground that his heavenly Father doesn't know about and take notice of. And then Jesus said those beautiful words, how much more valuable are you than a spiral? Father, I pray that you would help us to learn our lessons from the wilderness tonight. You never promised us a bed of roses. What you have promised, Father, to your children is that you would take the thorns of the bed of roses and you'll turn it into our good and to your glory. And for that is what we pray in Jesus' name, for his glory. Amen. Thank you. you. May be seated. I want to talk to you tonight about how God is always at work in his children's lives, despite whatever the circumstances may be. I think especially for young Christians, but for all Christians, at whatever stage of spiritual maturity you're at, this is probably, if not the, one of the most important lessons you need to learn. That God is always at work in His children's lives despite the circumstances. He's not just at work when times are good. Brother Tommy, He's at work when times are at their worst. So I want to take... A few lessons from the wilderness tonight as we think on that line. First, I want us to look at lessons from the wilderness, learning from our mistakes. Learning from our mistakes. You know the road that led Moses from the palace of Pharaoh to the wilderness of Midian was paved with nothing but the best intentions. Moses had nothing but good intentions when he forsook he rejected, uh, Hebrews tells us, all the privileges of Egypt in order to identify himself with the children of Israel. He had nothing but the best of intentions. 
But after Pharaoh found out that he had killed the Egyptians, listen, brothers and sisters, Pharaoh didn't want Moses dead or alive. He wanted Moses dead, period. So Moses did the only logical thing a Baptist can do, run away. Moses fled. But for all Moses' good intentions, as we've already preached about, there's really no other nice way of putting it. No, Moses, when he killed that Egyptian, sinned against God. He had committed murder. And it was not Moses' place to kill that Egyptian. In fact, as we already talked to refresh your memory in our last message, God had not even called Moses yet to lead his people out of Egypt. So when Moses took his action into his own hands, he was outside the will of God. And by the time Moses will learn the lesson of the wilderness, by the time he finished paying for his impetuous action, he will be 80 years old. You know, that's a lesson for us tonight, isn't it? That if we're not careful, when we take matters into our own hands, when we act impetuously, when, when we don't first ask, is this the will of God, what I'm thinking about doing, it may cost you and it may cost me many years in the wilderness while we learn our lessons. Amen? I've had my desert wanderings. I don't know about you. But that, that's what that tells me. It tells me that, that when we make a mistake, that's not the end of the world. Moses made a bad mistake. But brothers and sisters, it, it's not the end of the world to make a mistake. What we are to be afraid of is that we don't learn from our mistakes. We ought to learn from them. And we ought to let Jesus use them to get us in the place where He can use us for His glory. Notice in verse 16 and 17, as Moses fled into the wilderness, that His first test came quickly. The test came when he sat down by the well and these seven daughters of the uh, high priest of God, a priest of God, a uh, uh, rule, came and drew water. And these shepherds came and, and drove the women away. You see, once again, Moses, like he was in Egypt when he killed the Egyptian, he's confronted with a gross injustice. He's confronted with women being abused by men. And if you haven't figured it out yet, I have absolutely no tolerance for any man that abuses a woman. That's not really the point here, but I had to say that. And, 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 and neither should you. But Moses shows real restraint here. Because in verse 16, 17, he says he drove them away, but notice he didn't kill them. And in verse 19, even though Moses was a stranger in Midian, he wasn't about to let a bunch, a band of unruly shepherds take advantage of these helpless young women. So Moses courageously rose to their defense. But this time, he did not kill the shepherds. And believe me, brothers and sisters, he probably easily could have with his military training that he would have been given in his younger years in Egypt. And what we see here as Moses is in the wilderness, he's already beginning to learn some lessons. He's beginning to see that he needs to act like a deliverer. And even after he rescues the girls, did you notice that he came to their aid further by watering their flock? And did you notice in our text how you read the astonishment when the girls are telling their father? He even drew water for us. Do you realize in ancient times that that would have been totally unthinkable for a man to do such a menial task for a woman. But verse 19b says that he even drew water for us and watered the flock. You see, Moses is not only acting like a deliverer, he's beginning to act like a servant leader of God. He's beginning to serve. He's learning to lead. And brothers and sisters, if you ever want to lead the people of God, the first thing you need to learn is how to serve. Amen? You need to be willing to do the menial things. You need to be faithful in the small things because anyone who would be aspired to be a spiritual leader, no matter if it's in Awana, in Sunday, whatever it might be that God's called you to do, you are starting in a good place to learn how to do it 
if you will find yourself a humble place of service. Jesus, of course, is our greatest example. Listen to what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 20, verse 26. Jesus says, when the disciples, when He knew that they were arguing among themselves who will be the greatest, which by the way, that proved they were Baptists as well. Jesus said, it's not this way among you. But whoever wishes to become great among you shall be your servant. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give His life a ransom for many. So Moses, as he gets this bad time of his life, he, he's made a terrible mistake, and he's driven out into the wilderness. He begins to learn something valuable by learning from his mistakes. Let me ask you something. Are you learning from your mistakes? And if you sit here and say, I don't make mistakes, that's the first thing you need to learn. All of us, brothers and sisters, unfortunately, make mistakes. Some of them, we have nothing but the best intentions. I make mistakes all the time. And the thing that disappoints me the most is I know my heart. And I know I meant well. But just like Moses, I blew it. And I used to go down when brother, I used to go down to the jail. And I used to minister to the prisoners. And the thing that would break my heart when you got to talking to them and got involved with them and they knew that you cared about them, you'd begin to find out their life story. And, and this is their third time in jail, or their fourth time. Or the, and this is their second time. And, and they got three brothers, and each one of their brothers and their father is in jail. And I would tell them, guys, listen. You don't have to hang your head because you're in jail. God loves you and God can turn your life around. But what you need to be ashamed of and what you need to hang your head over is if you don't learn from what mistakes you made that got you in here and you keep coming back. Well, boy, I tell you, that's good wisdom for the church. Amen? You know the definition they say of a fool is somebody keeps doing the same old thing and is surprised that they don't get different results. That describes a lot of people in their spiritual journey. They keep making the same mistakes. They don't learn from it. And then they don't understand why things don't get better. But now what you notice, secondly, lessons from the wilderness. Taking the time to be prepared. Taking the time... To be prepared. Have you ever thought as you read the Word of God, something jumps out at me in Scripture, and that is this, that God seems to never get in a very great hurry when He begins to prepare His servants. Have you ever noticed that? God doesn't get in a hurry when He begins to call somebody and prepare them for service. And I think there's no better example of that than the prophet Moses. I mean, think about it. Moses is going to spend four decades. Folks, in case you ain't been in school a while, that's 40 years. That's longer than some of you here tonight have been alive. 40 years ago, I was a senior in high school. That's how long 40 years is, amen? That's a long time. Moses is going to spend 40 years in the wilderness before he ever begins... His public ministry. Somebody wrote this and I, I, I recorded it and I thought, man, what a great way of expressing this. Someone wrote, and I don't know who, but he said, and I quote, Moses was 40 years in Egypt learning something. He was 40 years in the desert learning to be nothing. And he was 40 years in the wilderness leading the people of God, proving God to be everything. Amen. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that wonderful? Isn't it worth spending 40 years learning to be nothing? If that will prepare you to make God everything, if that's what it takes. You see, whenever we're tempted to grow impatient with God's timetable for our lives, we ought to think about Moses. We ought to uh, think about how Moses spent two years 40 years in Egypt, 40 years in the wilderness, 80 years old before he went to Pharaoh and said, let my people go. God says, let my people go. He spent two years for every year he was leading the children of Israel in the desert. Had you ever thought about that? 
For any time you begin to get impatient, you think God's not acting fast enough in your life. God's not doing something in your timetable. You ought to think about Moses. I, 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 well, I just want to say it because God leads me to say it. If it upsets somebody, deal with it. But I come from a part of the country that, that uh, let me say this. If, if God calls a man to preach, God is plenty capable of just instantly making that man a great preacher. He's, he's, he's capable. But when I read the Word of God, I just don't see God acting that way. Amen? I see God calling people, and I saw God being very patient with them and preparing for them. Now, I come from part of the country that says if God's called you, you don't need to prepare. You don't need to put your best foot forth. You just need to trust God and get in the pulpit and He'll fill your mouth. That's why I've heard a lot of very rambling, boring, long sermons. Amen? Somebody never prepared and they got in the pulpit just hoping God would fill their mouth. Now, now I'm not putting down anybody. You can be self-taught. But I'm a believer that if God, and I'm using preaching as an example, I am a firm believer, and I'll never apologize for it, that if God's called you to do something, you are to care enough to prepare to do it. Amen? Amen. Brother Bill Moon is a nurse in ICU or Donna is and, and some of these people. You know what? If I have a heart attack night and Bill's my nurse tomorrow, I hope, pray, Bill went to school. Don't you? I hope he prepared to give me an IV and check my heart monitor. Lord, have mercy. If God's called you to do something, even if it's Sunday school or whatever it is, if, if Bill Moon is holding the lives of men and women, their physical life in hand, how much more are you are to be willing to be prepared to hold the souls of men and women in your hand? Amen. 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 This is serious stuff, people. And I just don't see God getting in a hurry and preparing people for ministry. You see, God, look at Moses here in this text. God's going to use three experiences here to prepare Moses for his primary calling, which is to lead the children of Israel out of Egypt. Notice with me, first of all, how Moses learned from his living situation. He's going to be 40 years in, in the wilderness. Now, the Midianites, where he's taking up residence here, they lived on the Sinai Peninsula. And they were a tribe of desert nomads. If you lived with the Midianites, that meant you lived in the wilderness. That meant you'd be cut off from the rest of civilization. That means you would have been reduced to, to the necessities of finding food and water almost on a daily or weekly basis. That means a person would have been forced to just cast himself daily on the mercy of God to sustain them. And that's why in the Bible you see throughout God's Word that the wilderness is a place that men go to meet God. Amen? Amen. Think about Jacob. He saw a stairway to heaven in the wilderness. Think about how Elijah heard that small, still voice that said, Elijah, what are you doing here in the wilderness? Think about how John the Baptist was prepared and came preaching the gospel of repentance from the wilderness. Think about how the Apostle Paul, when God called him, the first thing he did for 14 years, he went into the wilderness to search the Scriptures for the Christ of the Old Testament. So Moses went into the wilderness to meet the God of Abraham. But not only... Was it a place that people went to meet God? It also, for Moses, was a great place of practical significance. Have you ever thought what Moses learned in those 40 years on the Sinai Peninsula? Would he not shepherding sheep and leading them around and finding grass and water? Would he have not got very thorough with the geography and the topography of the Sinai Peninsula? Do you realize that when it was time for Moses to lead God's people out of Egypt and God said, no, don't go that way. I want you to go towards the Sinai Peninsula and go back to Mount Horeb where the burning bush where you met me. Don't you understand? Moses already knew everything in a practical geographical way that was necessary to lead God's people back to the mountain of God. Somebody say amen. amen. Isn't God good to prepare people like that? 
But doubtlessly, the greatest significant for Moses, the lesson of his living situation was, was spiritual. You know, before Moses led out the children of Egypt, I think it was really necessary that Moses had his own personal exodus out of Egypt. He might be getting prepared to leave Egypt, but he had to make sure he got Egypt out of him. So he had to learn for himself what it was like to be an outcast. He had to learn for himself what does it feel like to be oppressed? What does it feel like to be an alien in a foreign land? And when I think about how God gave Moses the lessons of the wilderness, and then I begin to think about some of the darkest moments in my life. Haven't you had dark moments in your life? I'm going to tell you something. If you're here today and you, you haven't had your wilderness experience, you just haven't lived long enough, you hang on. Because we live in a sin-cursed world. I promise you it's coming. And I begin to think about how God will allow us to go through trying, dark experiences in order to make better disciples, in order to make better ministers, out of us. Have you ever thought about dark times that way? I can tell you, brothers and sisters, some of the darkest moments of my life. You see, people see a pastor or they see a preacher preaching and every now and then, Brother Tommy, he, he actually hits a double or a triple and God really works to him. And, and people see him and say, oh, I wish I could be like that. You don't know what the man of God has been put through for God to prepare him for that moment. And I'm telling you, when God has taken me to the next level of understanding in Him, it's been during the darkest time of my life. I wouldn't give my three years in seminary for anything. God prepared me intellectually in a powerful way, but I'm going to tell you something. He taught me just as much with a brain tumor. He taught me just as much when a doctor one day put film on the board and told me something that was supposed to be applied to somebody else. I was supposed to be there as a minister holding their hand. It doesn't supposed to be me, but it was my brain and the film of my brain that showed a brain tumor about the size of a small potato. You see, God takes everything. And I'm here to tell you, I'm not much of a pastor, but I'm a better pastor because of a brain tumor. And I've had other experiences. Haven't you had some of the darkest times in your life and you begin to think, oh God, how can this possibly be for my good? And then on the back side of it, you see, oh, this is what God was doing. Moses learned from his living situation. But notice, secondly, Moses learned from his family situation. Now Moses was single when he left Egypt, but the priest of Midian ruled. He didn't let him stay that way long, did he? Did you notice that? Pretty slick. It's very interesting reading when you really think about verse 20 and 21. The daughters get back and they tell their father, you know, that, that this man, this stranger, this balking Charlton Heston has jumped up by the rail and drove off the shepherds. Who wouldn't want their daughter to be married to Charlton Heston? <laughs> Amen? I can't help but think about Moses and see Charlton Heston. I, I, that's just me. But I'm sure Moses wasn't a bad-looking guy. And the man had seven daughters. And he wasn't about to let a catch like Moses get away, was he? He says to his daughters, he said, What in the world were you thinking? Go get that bachelor and get him to come here and eat. So they went and got Moses and they got him to agree to stay with the man. Now, marriage was... Well, they'd already started playing the bridal march. You do the math. Seven daughters, one bachelor, desert, wilderness, no TV, Marriage is right around the corner. Amen? <laughs> Marriage is right around the corner. But I want you to notice in verse 22, not only did Moses become a husband in Midian, he also became a father, didn't he? The Bible says that through his wife, he had a son, he named him Gershom. And Gershom in Hebrew means to drive out or to expel. 
He was remembering that he had been driven out of Egypt, that he had been expelled out of Egypt, and he calls his first son Gershon as a constant reminder of that. And it was Moses' family situation that was all part of God's plan to prepare Moses for ministry. As a husband, he had to learn how to love and serve his wife. As a father, he had to learn how to love and care and discipline his children. And not only that, it was in that same home, that same family situation, that Moses would have grown in his relationship with the God of Abraham. Now, from what we can tell, the Midianites seem to have worshipped the one true and living God. It is very significant that Ruel's name, he was called the priest of Midian, and his name literally meant friend of God. And when we see him later on, and his name is then called Jethro, when we see him later on in the Exodus account, he gives Moses very God-honoring wisdom. So it's highly likely that Moses received spiritual instruction from his father-in-law. And by the time that Moses in chapter 3 meets God at the burning bush, I think God had prepared him for that moment. For when he was reintroduced to the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. So brothers and sisters, when God is at work in a person's life. And by the way, the Bible says God is always at work in your life. Did you know that? Did you know in the fifth chapter, John, the Lord Jesus said, My Father is always at work. He never sleeps. He never slumbers. He never takes vacation. He never gets caught by surprise. He has no plan B. It's all plan A. And God is always at work in your life. The question is whether or not you're learning from your situation. And when God's at work in a person's life, nothing happens by accident, does it? Does it? Nothing happens by accident. It was no mistake that Moses happened to sit down by this well. It was not an accident when these girls came and Moses drove away these shepherds. It was no accident that he ended up residing at Ruel's home. Because God wanted him to learn from his family situation. But I want you to know thirdly that he learned from his work situation. You see, in the wilderness, job, Moses got a full-time job as well as a full-time wife. And his job was a shepherd. Now we see Moses in chapter one, verse, chapter 3, verse 1. He's out, the Bible says, tending the flock. Now that would never have been a profession that Moses would have chose for himself. Do you remember back in Genesis chapter 36 when Joseph was giving his brothers advice when they were going to move down to, to Egypt and, and uh, Joseph told his brothers, said, hey, make sure you tell them you're shepherds because the Bible says all shepherds are detestable to the Egyptians. This is not a job that Moses would have selected for himself. But you see, God's at work. And God wanted Moses to be a shepherd because there's a lot to be learned from shepherding sheep. For starters, sheep are not very bright. Amen? Amen. They're not. They're about as stupid an animal as you've ever known. Brent and I have had cows, we've had goats, we've had horses, and found all of them to be quite intelligent. But I'm told that sheep are about as dumb as well as sheep. They're not very intelligent, and that means that they need a shepherd. They need someone to lead them to food and water. Secondly, sheep are an easy target for predators. They'll just stand there and let a whole two wolves eat the whole flock. And that means they need someone to protect them. Additionally, sheep are prone to wander, which means that they need someone to go and fetch them and bring them back to the fold. And short sheep are completely dependent on the shepherd for their care. And brothers and sisters, that's why God says you and I are the sheep of His pasture. Amen? Amen. Because we're the same way as the people of God. See, we need divine guidance. We need nourishment. We need protection. And that's why Moses had to learn how to feed and defend and rescue and retrieve the lost sheep of Israel. So what did God do? 
He had him doing a job that he would never chose for himself for 40 years. You see, here's something that we need to really learn. That by being faithful in the small things, being faithful in the small things, God will prepare you for bigger things. Have you ever really thought about that? You should. I mean, it's right in the Scriptures. Remember the parable of the talents? Listen to what Jesus said in Matthew 25, 21. Jesus said, His Master said, Well done, good and faithful slave. You are faithful with a few things, and I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your Master. You see, you and I, you and I tonight, we may not be named Moses. But God still has a plan for each and every one who's here tonight. Do you realize that? God's got a plan. Your name might name Moses. It might be Butch. It might be Tinkle Bell. It don't matter what your name is. God's got a plan for you. And the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, He says, We are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. That's not talking about somebody else. That's talking about you. It's talking about me. That means that God's at work in our lives and He's preparing us for His service. And God doesn't just have good works for us to do. Aren't you glad to know that God also prepares us to do those good works? And He does that through, most of the time, He does that through ordinary life experiences. Our problem is we want to tell God we need a burning bush. We are looking for Damascus Road experiences. And God is coming to us and He's saying, how about open your eyes where you're at, with where you're living, with your family situation, with your job situation. Why don't you just open your eyes and learn the lessons and be faithful where you're at. Be faithful in the little things and God will take you to bigger things. And if you've not been faithful where you're at already, why in the world would the great infinite wise God give you more? Have you ever thought about that? If, you, if Moses couldn't have been a faithful shepherd in the wilderness, how could he have been a shepherd of the people of God? Well, lessons from the wilderness. That's a good lesson, isn't it? I'm glad that God uses our mistakes, aren't you? I'm glad God doesn't throw us in the garbage dump when we, He says you messed up. I'm glad that He can take a mistake, even the kinds of mistake that Moses did, murder, and He can turn them into good. James Boyce, who used to be a president of Southern Seminary uh, years and years ago, James Boyce said this. He said, God can teach us through the failure of our own plans that He is capable of working for us and in us, and I like this, in spite of us. Isn't that good? I thank God sometimes. Amen. Anytime God does something through me, I have to just go off somewhere honestly and say, God, thank You for using me in spite of me. And voice goes on and says, only after we fail do we become aware that it is God and not ourselves who is working. You see, God will use your living situation. God will use your family situation. God will use your work situation. Even if you're working in a job that doesn't match you think your gifts or your interests, God will still use it. God will use it for your good and for His glory. So I, let me just encourage you now. I don't know where you're at. I don't know what situation you feel like you're in. But what I want to encourage you to do is to learn what God is trying to teach you. Is that fair? Whatever you're at, just try to learn what God's trying to teach you. All right, third and closing, lessons from the wilderness. God is at work everywhere. I'm glad that I serve that om omniscient, omnipotent, omnipresent God, aren't you? I'm glad that there's nowhere I can go, there's no depth, I can, no hole I can crawl into, and God's not there still working in my life. 
He's working everywhere. Notice verse 23. Notice how in our text the scene shifts back to Egypt. It shifts from the wilderness to Egypt where the Israelites are still in bondage. It's interesting, isn't it? For 40 years while Moses is trying to learn his lessons, for 40 years, the only thing that's changed in Egypt is that the Pharaoh that wanted to kill Moses, verse 23, has died. Yet for 40 years, year after year, the Israelites have been under the toll of the hot desert sun. Year after year, for 40 years, they've been building monuments to Pharaoh's glory. Surely in 40 years, they felt like God had forgotten them. Surely they even felt like God had cursed them. Surely for 40 years, they felt like God had abandoned them altogether. But brothers and sisters, when it seemed like they didn't have a prayer, that's the one thing they did have. Amen was prayer. And I'm glad that verse 23b says, the sons of Israel sighed because of their bondage. And they cried out. That's prayer. And their cry for help because of their bondage rose up to God. And the Bible describes their anguish. It describes their prayer with words that means intense grief and bitter distress and painful agony. In fact, it seems that their suffering was so great that all they could do was cry out to God. I don't know about you, but sooner or later, every believer will find yourself there. You will find yourself in a situation where you understand all you've got is prayer. The only hope you've got is God is prayer and you're hurting so bad you can't even put it into words. Aren't you glad that the Bible says in Romans 8, 26, that in the same way the Spirit also helps our weaknesses, for we do not know how to pray as we should, but the Spirit Himself intercedes with us with groanings too deep for words. Aren't you glad for that? Aren't you glad that God's Spirit just takes over who indwells you when you find your place where you're just crying out to God? David was in a cave. David was hiding from Saul. David had been called to be a great servant of God, to be anointed as king. And David finds himself in the pit. He don't know what to do. And he says in Psalm 69, he says, Save me, O God, for the waters have threatened my life. And I've sunk in deep mire and there is no foothold. I've come into deep water and the flood overflows me. I'm weary with my crying. My throat is parched. My eyes fail while I wait for my God. Listen to me, church. When your needs are so deep, when you're intense, your hurt is so intense that words can't describe it, God still understands. And He's still worth crying out to. And He hears our cries for help. And He hears our groans for deliverance just like He heard the children of Israel's groan in the days of Moses. And I'm glad that the news gets even better. I'm glad that God not only hears our prayers, but He also answers our prayers. It's one thing for God to hear. It's another thing for God to answer. Verse 34, verse 25, it says that their cries did not fall on deaf years, it says God heard their cries. He heard their prayers. He had been hearing them all along for 40 years while Moses is learning his lesson. He's hearing their prayers. And I want you to notice, in the rest of our time together, God does four things that ought to bless you tonight if you're hurting. He hears and He remembers. And He sees and he takes notice. Did you see that in the Word of God? You see, when people pray, God responds. First, the Bible says that he sees. The Bible says that he saw. He saw their bondage. I'm glad that the Word of God tells me that every blow of the hand that buffets a child of God it is watched by the eyes that never sleep and they never slumber. God, they may be somebody persecuting you. They may be somebody abusing you. But I want you to know your God sees what's going on. It's not taking Him by surprise. But not only does He see, but He hears. He also hears. Psalm 34, 15 says, The eyes of the Lord are towards the righteous and His ears are open." to their cry. 
And not only does he see, and not only does he, he hear, but he also remembers. Did you notice that it says that after he's heard and, and he saw, did you see in verse 24 it said, God remembered his covenant with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. God remembers. Aren't you glad that God doesn't forget like me and you? Aren't you glad that God remembers His unbreakable promise of salvation? Aren't you glad that He remembers His love relationship with His people? Aren't you glad that God remembers that He promised, I will be your God and you will be my people? Aren't you glad in that church that God has never forgotten His covenant promises and God still remembers in 2014, He still remembers what He promised in Genesis 3.15. Amen? God remembers. And it would do well that we should remember that all these connections between God and His covenant people of Israel, it ought, to, it ought to remind us that the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob and the God of Moses never changes. He's the same today as He was in Moses' day. And He'll be the same a billion years from now as He is today. The God who made His covenant with the patriarchs is the very same God that led the people out of Egypt. He is the very same God that sent Jesus as our Savior. He's the very same God when we stand before Him will remember His covenant in the blood of Jesus and say, Come in, my good and faithful child. I'm glad that God remembers that He promised a Redeemer to free us from our slavery of sin. I'm glad He remembers that He promised a Son who would keep the whole law for His people. I'm glad He remembers that He promised a Lamb that would take the punishment for our sin. And brothers and sisters, I'm telling you now, and I'll tell it till God takes me home, that salvation from beginning to end is from God, through God, and to God, for God. 